is Ryan Scott. And um, uh, testing, one, two, three. Okay, fantastic. Let's go, Ryan. All right, thank you. And, and thank you for sticking around so long. Uh, hopefully, this will be worth the wait. So, today, I want to tell you a story about compiler verification. Uh, specifically, we have a uh, compiler that takes a high level uh, piece of stream code and then compiles it to low level C code. And then we have a verification tool that proves that the two are equivalents. So if, if you stuck around at ICFP long enough, this is a story that probably sounds familiar. Compiler verification is certainly uh, not a new thing. Uh, there have been many verified compilers before, but uh, there are some, some constraints that we worked under that makes our story a little bit unique. So one thing that is interesting about our project is that uh, both the, the source language, which is called Copilot, and the compiler for it, which is called Copilot C99, uh, both of these existed well before we ever started the project. And moreover, we were not at liberty to make extensive changes to these in pursuit of verifying them. Uh, so when we wrote this verification tool, which we called Copilot Verifier, we had to make this work with well-established pieces of tech. Uh, another constraint that we operated under is that uh, we didn't have a lot of time or, or money overall compared to some of these other verification efforts, which uh, took many years to complete. Uh, in contrast, we only had about one year to complete this project on a, a pretty small team of engineers. Uh, so despite these pretty heavy constraints, we were able to get the project done. And I attribute this to the fact that we were very judicious with our novelty budget. Uh, we, you know, we, we sort of identified parts that we want to focus on and, and spend a lot of, of effort getting right, but for the most part, we built on top of existing formal methods tools. Um, and so a lot of parts of this talk will look very familiar to people in the audience. And I, I think it's a testament to the fact that you can take these formal methods libraries, sort of just plug them into your system, and it works. And you can use this to save yourself a lot of time in the long run. So this is sort of a, a success story about how formal methods have, have come a long way. Uh, so what is new in this talk? Uh, so to give a little preview of what's to come, uh, Copilot Verifier proves program equivalence and does so using a bi-simulation-based te technique. And when I say by simulation here, I mean that we, we take the stream program as well as the C program that it compiles into. We sort of represent the states of each program as a state machine, and we prove that they're in by simulation with each other. Uh, there's a more precise definition of what that means in the paper, but for the purposes of this talk, that just means that the observable behavior of both types of programs coincide with each other. And What's nice about our, our verification tool is that it's almost completely automatic. Uh, it discharges a lot of the heavy lifting to SMT solvers under the hood, uh, which means that uh, you get most of this for free. So how do we do? Well, we managed to complete a fully working version of Copilot Verifier in just under one year uh, with a team of two engineers working part-time on the project. And what's really exciting is that this is actually going to have a real-world impact. You know, uh, it's, it's kind of escaped the research phase, and there are plans to actually use this uh, on missions at NASA in the future, which is, which is really exciting to me. Uh, now, as you can probably imagine, there's a, a pretty high bar for safety if you want to use some piece of code in a NASA mission, so naturally there's some red tape we have to clear first. But in the meantime, we've been trying Copilot Verifier on some examples that look like things you might find on a NASA mission. Uh, and through this process, we've already discovered 10 bugs in the Copilot compiler, which is you know, a good sign that this is actually checking for interesting properties. Um, some of these bugs include things like potential memory unsafety. And if, if you have this kind of bug trigger in a, in a mission where there's a lot of money or lives on the line, that could potentially be disastrous. So it's good to catch these things early. Uh, we also ran Copilot Verifier on the corpus of programs in the Copilot test suite, and it was able to verify all of them, which is also an encouraging sign that it can handle things that you would find in the real world. And this includes some examples of algorithms that you would find, like uh, the well-clear violation algorithm, that unmanned aircraft that you would use on a, on a mission um, might employ. Uh, so, so that's sort of the background of, of the talk, and uh, I want to spend the rest of it going into more details about what exactly this Copilot Verifier tool is doing. 
So in order to do that, I need to talk a bit more about what the source language of the compiler is, uh, which is Copilot. Uh, the word Copilot is a little bit overloaded these days in CS, but when I say Copilot, I specifically mean a framework and language for writing uh, monitors using a technique called runtime verification. So Copilot, uh, it, it allows you to write programs in a stream-based domain-specific language that is embedded in Haskell, uh, so it's, it's pretty high level as far as these things go. And uh, it's designed for writing monitors that you link against some larger application. And the idea is that the monitor will check if the application misbehaves at runtime. And if it does, it will issue some kind of warning telling it to take corrective action. And, and this is the idea behind runtime verification. Uh, this is a pretty old language. It was originally developed back in 2010 in collaboration with us at Gawa and the National Institute of Aerospace, and it's been uh, maintained mostly by NASA since then. So uh, it's already over a decade old by this point. Uh, let, let me give you a sort of sample of what co-pilot programs look like to give you an idea of, of what we're doing. Uh, so the basic unit of computation in a copilot program is a stream. So here we define the Fibonacci number stream, and you'll notice that this, this Fibs definition is defined in terms of itself, and that is very much intentional because these are infinite streams, uh, and each element in the stream represents some moment in time. So in, uh, starting at time step one, you'd have the Fibonacci number one, and then as you advance time, you get uh, larger and larger Fibonacci numbers. So at the next step, you'd have one, next step, you have two, next step, three, then five, then eight, and so on and so forth. So you can keep advancing time as many steps as you want. Uh, once you have streams, you can write operations that sort of, um, uh, they, they sort of perform analysis on the streams and do interesting things with them. So for instance, we can define a function that takes a stream as an argument and then produces a stream as a result. Uh, so this will check if all of the uh, ints in a stream are even or not. And uh, if you've programmed in Haskell before, this code will, will probably look familiar, and that's because we sort of take a lot of common operations in the Haskell prelude and lift them up to the stream level, such as uh, arithmetic, uh, modular division, equality, and, and so on and so forth. So where the rubber hits the road in a co-pilot program is writing a specification, and that's done with this spec type. Uh, a spec consists of one or more triggers. So in this example, we have a trigger called even. Uh, a trigger takes a stream of Booleans and any time you sample a true value in the stream of booleans, the trigger gets fired. And that's an indication to the application that's being monitored that it should take some kind of corrective action. So in this example, we are monitoring if uh, there are any even Fibonacci numbers that we sample. Uh, so this is very simple, but you could imagine a more sophisticated example that's, that does something like monitor the engine in a thermostat. And if the engine gets too high, you might want to issue a trigger, for instance. So once you have a spec, uh, you can feed this into the Copilot C compiler, which is called Copilot C99, and it will generate some efficient C code that you can actually run on something like an embedded system. Here is an example of what this generated C code might look like, and uh, don't worry about reading this line by line. The thing I want to highlight here is sort of the difference in operation between the two types of programs. So the stream program on the left uses infinite streams, which is all well and good, uh, but the C program on the right, it has to run in constant space. So naturally it can't you know, have infinite data in memory. So what it does is use a fixed size array to store a finite subsection of the stream in memory at a given moment in time. And then as you advance the, uh, the state of the program, as, as you advance time, you compute a new Fibonacci number, store it in the array, and then repeat the process. Uh, and as it turns out, you only need the two most recent Fibonacci numbers to compute the next one, so this array only has to be of size two. So that, that lets us save on quite a bit of space. Now, it's my claim that these two programs have observably equivalent behavior. Uh, but you have to sort of squint at this code a bit to convince yourself that that's the case. Uh, I mean, this is kind of a small example, so there's not that much code here, but uh, if, if you build a copilot program of, of any reasonable size, this gets quite unwieldy. And if you make a mistake when writing the copilot 
compiler, then uh, you might potentially overlook something here. Like, you know, you'll notice there's a lot of tricky business here with modular division. And if the compiler writer forgot to include one of those modular divisions, then uh, that could potentially be disastrous, especially since that is how uh, the array gets indexed. If you index that array out of bounds, then, then something terrible could happen. Uh, so when, when we pitched this idea to NASA, they're like, okay, we, we need something uh, a bit more rigorous here than just having a, a human stare at this a long time and, and give us a thumbs up or thumbs down. So, so that was sort of the question we had to answer. How do we know in general that Copilot generated C code is trustworthy? So we, we thought about this question and we came up with three possible approaches for, for how to go about this. So one approach is, well, as I mentioned, we could have a human whose job it is to audit the code by hand and, and be the, the arbiter of whether it's allowed to be used on a mission or not. Um, and, you know, this, this is one way you could do it, but hopefully I don't have to convince an ICFP audience that this is not a perfect solution. Uh, humans are, are certainly uh, not without faults, and as you can see at this leaked footage of a frazzled NASA auditor, uh, if you stare at auto-generated C code for a while, you start to lose your mind. Um, so, so we wanted something a, a bit more rigorous than this. Another option is we could formally verify the entire Copilot compiler. Uh, this is, again, something that has been done before in the likes of KML and CompCert and Valus and, and things of this sort. Uh, but the problem is that this is a very time and labor intensive process. These, these sorts of efforts typically take multiple years with a, a lot of people working on them. And we simply did not have that at our disposal. So we needed something more lightweight than this. Um, so, you know, I, I said this is a compiler verification project, so what do we do if we didn't verify the entire compiler? Well, what we, we ultimately ended up doing is a, a lighter weight approach called translation validation. And this is an idea dating back to the 90s, and the idea is that, you know, in contrast to a, a fully verified compiler where you know that for any given source program that the target program it produces has the same semantics, uh, with translation validation, you sort of run your prover alongside the compiler when it is invoked on one specific source program, and then that will tell you that you know, for that specific target program, the two have equivalent semantics. So, so this is a weaker result than full compiler verification. It doesn't, uh, you know, you don't have this for all source and target program at the, at the beginning of your, your theorem that you prove. Uh, but despite the fact that it's weaker, it's, it's nice for us because it means that we can sort of uh, attach this to an existing compiler without having to substantially rewrite parts of it uh, to make it work. And this is great for us because it meant we were able to get this done in a much less time. So this is ultimately why we chose the translation validation as, as how we approach this problem. So, let me go in a bit more about what exactly Copilot Verifier is doing when it proves something. So to start off with, uh, you need to have a Copilot program, which is written as a Haskell file. Uh, this is going to run alongside the Copilot C compiler. So you have to first turn that into a C program, and then you feed that through the Clang C compiler, which produces LLVM bit code. So now you have a stream program on the top and LLVM code on the bottom. And once you have this, the next step is you need to extract the semantics of each program. So the way we do this is that we wrote a, a, a library at Galois called what4, which has an intermediate language uh, that is uh, good for proving program equivalence and also allows you to um, communicate with an SMT solver, which I'll get into a bit. So uh, this, this involves two steps. You have to first extract the semantics of the Copilot stream program, and we wrote a little tool called Copilot Theorem to do this. Uh, that is relatively straightforward since Copilot and what for are both written in a kind of functional style, so one translates to the other relatively straightforwardly. Um, translating the semantics of uh, LLVM bit code, on the other hand, is a more involved process uh, since it's an imperative language. So the way we go about this is that we have a symbolic execution engine uh, called Crucible that we developed at Gawa specifically for uh, things of this sort. So we use Crucible to simulate the LLVM code and then uh, a side effect of that process is it generates uh, what for semantics for the LLVM bit code. Once you have the semantics of the two types of programs, 
then you feed them into the prover part of Copilot Verifier, which checks the actual equivalence. And this, this, this proof process will generate verification conditions and feed them into an external SMT solver. And the idea is that if the SMT solver can discharge all of the proof goals, then you have successfully verified the equivalence of the two programs. Uh, so there's a lot going on this slide, and at a, in a vacuum, it looks like it would take a long time to sort of fit all the pieces of this slide together. But surprisingly, that wasn't the case. And the reason is because most of the things on this slide existed before we started the project. In particular, everything that's not grayed out here is something that we already had when we started. Uh, so, so naturally, we had the Copilot C compiler, um, and also we had the Clang uh, C compiler and SMT solvers. Those have both been around for a long time. Uh, we also had these two libraries that we developed at Gala, uh, but we've developed them in the context of other projects. We have used Crucible and what for on, on many large-scale verification efforts uh, to verify imperative programming languages like C, LLVM, and so on. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have time in this talk to really go in depth about how Crucible and what for work, but if you want more details, we wrote an ICFP paper in 2019 where we talk about them in much more detail. So I'd refer you to that paper if you want to learn more. Uh, so the only two things on this slide that we really had to do, uh, like a substantial amount of effort on here to, to complete the project are these two things. So we had to uh, extend this Copilot theorem tool to be able to handle uh, the things that we needed for the sake of the prover part of Copilot Verifier, and we also had to write the prover itself. Um, so I think the prover is, is probably the most interesting part, so, so let me zoom in on that a little bit. Uh, so I mentioned before that Copilot Verifier uh, does program equivalence checking via by simulation. Um, so, so to be a bit more specific there, uh, we, we discharge things to SMT solvers, which they they have sort of first order theories and by simulation is not a property that easily fits into the theories that SMT solvers are good at reasoning about. Um, so what we do instead is, is, is we do a little trick where we instead prove a slightly stronger property which is extensional quality and then extensional quality implies by simulation as a corollary. And SMT solvers are quite good at proving extensional quality so that works well. Um, so when I say extensional quality, I mean that um, if you take a, a copilot stream program and its corresponding generated C code, um, at a given time step, you should be able to show that the same set of trigger functions are called in both programs with the same arguments. Uh, another thing you have to prove, which is kind of interesting, is that uh, copilot has partial operations. For instance, it supports division, so you could potentially divide by zero. So if the stream program divides by zero, then you should also be able to show that the C program divides by zero and vice versa. Separately from this, you can also prove that it never divides by zero ever, but for the sake of showing extensional quality, you only have to show that uh, you know, they're crash equivalent, so to speak. So how that works is you take uh, the semantics of each program as what for, uh, you turn them into a label transition system uh, where the nodes of the system are the, the states at a given moment in time. Um, and then you sort of match up the states in each label transition system and generate verification conditions for, for various things that are required for this extensional quality proof. So for instance, you, uh, returning to the earlier example, uh, we need to check that the even trigger fires in both programs with the same arguments. And that will uh, that'll turn to a really huge chunk of auto-generated SMT queries, which uh, the, the contents of the SMT queries aren't particularly important, but uh, that is what's happening under the hood. And then you give all the verification conditions to a solver like Z3, and if it can prove all the goals, then you know that the programs are equivalent. So this is a really interesting piece of applied formal methods. And as the case is with applied formal methods, uh, you typically have to do some clever engineering to make it work in practice. So um, one thing that was interesting about this project is how we had to handle floating point support. Uh, there's operations in Copilot such as sine, cosine, tangent, 
exponentiation, and so on, uh, which a lot of SMT solvers don't have the ability to reason about at a particularly deep level. Uh, so we had to sort of limit the reasoning that Copilot Verifier could do about programs involving floating point support in order to make it work. Um, if, if you want to know more, more details about that, I, I'd refer you to the paper where we talk about this in more depth. Um, another thing that we had to figure out is, you know, it, it's all well and good if Copilot Verifier can prove something, um, you know, as, uh, as, as functional programming enthusiasts, usually uh, that's good enough for us, but it's typically not good enough for uh, an auditing process that you would use at NASA. Um, they have a pretty high bar for proof. Uh, so we have to sort of explain the reasoning that Copilot Verifier does to convince auditors that it actually checked all the cases that it needs to. Uh, and this is a, a human-driven process. So we have to take the evidence that Copilot Verifier generates under the hood, and we have to sort of uh, explain it in a, a legible way. So in the paper, we, we describe how we do this, where we sort of take the high-level proof goals that the, the tool is trying to prove and link them up with uh, crucible, what for, and SMT goals. Um, and this is sort of an ongoing process, so uh, I'll be interested to see what this looks like when, when it's finished. Um, so that's ongoing. Um, but where we're looking at in the immediate future is that we want to use Copilot Verifier as part of, of, of uh, missions that require a higher degree of safety than what it's currently authorized to do. So, so NASA has this classification system for, for things that have, have various uh, trustworthiness requirements. So uh, at one level, there's class D, and that's the level that Copilot itself is currently released at. And then what we want to do is, is have uh, copilot monitors be combined with copilot verifier and used on class C missions, which are the level above class D. Um, so, so this is an ongoing process, and uh, it'll be a while before we probably have any tangible results there. But in the meantime, the source code for both copilot verifier and copilot are publicly available on GitHub. So if, if you want to try this out yourself, I encourage you to check them out. Uh, and that is everything I want to say, so if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. And as always, for the YouTube audience, remember to introduce yourself before asking a question. Okay, John Hughes from Shalmish. So when verification fails, what happens? Do you get a counterexample, or does it just say there's no proof? Uh, well, it, it does say there's no proof, and, and typically what it will do is, is try to give some kind of explanation of what went wrong. So it might be like, for instance, you have a goal that's too sophisticated for an SMT solver to prove. It might be that um, you had some undefined behavior and see that it wasn't able to reason about, it will try to produce some explanation. Um, now, now, we haven't spent a lot of engineering effort to make those kind of error messages more readable because uh, most of the time we want successful verification efforts to go through auditing instead of failed ones. Uh, but this is a problem we have thought about and it's, it's, it's tricky. Um, I, I'd be interested to hear about ideas of how to present failed verification efforts in a more legible way too, since I think that is kind of important for the, the user experience for this tool. Um, this is Facundo Dominguez from Twig. Uh, I wanted to ask if there were other uh, designs that uh, you, were, you considered before going for uh, using SMT servers to discharge the proofs. I, I didn't quite hear the first part of the question. Are, are you asking if, if we considered alternatives to SMT Yeah, solvers? if there were any designs that uh, could have been implemented instead of the current one, but uh, they were dis uh, discarded because technical reasons. Um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm still not sure I, I fully heard everything there, but um, I... I'll, I'll try to answer what I, I think might be your question, which is uh, the, the reason that we chose SMT solvers is because we wanted this process to be as push button as possible. The idea is you should be able to give it a copilot program as an input and it should do most of the work. And, and this is primarily because we want to put this in the, the hands of people who are not formal methods experts. So having like a high degree of interactivity required to complete the proof, I think would be a non-starter. Oh, that's good, thank you. Ben Gamari, well typed. 
Uh, just a point of clarification. You said during the talk that you had found cases in particular programs where verification had failed. I, I suppose that was cases where the compiler would miscompile those particular programs, not where those programs were not behaving according to some other specification that you, uh, you know, had uh, about uh, their behavior, intended behavior. In the case of the, uh, in the, the bugs that Copilot Verifier found in like the Copilot test suite and so forth, uh, yes, those were usually because of Copilot C99 bugs. Right. Um, there are other ways it could fail, like it, it could be that it, it, it generates an SMT query involving some operation that it doesn't know how to reason about, in which case it gives up. Uh, but but I, I wouldn't classify those as compiler bugs so much as limitations of the tool itself. And are there plans at some point to provide external specifications regarding intended behavior of the Copilot program and, and to verify against those behaviors as well? Uh, that, that would be an interesting line of, of future directions, yes. Like I mentioned, there are some operations that it, it's support for reasoning about them is limited. And I, I, like, just to give you an example here, like uh, we, we treat all floating point operations as uninterpreted at the moment. So it, it can't do much reasoning about floating point division like, like in this slide. So you have to be very careful about how you assemble things. So uh, we could add some, some more uh, intelligent reasoning about floating point division separately to sort of allow this kind of program to be verified successfully. But we have not done this yet. So presumably there's safety classes B and, B and A also? Uh, I, I believe so, yes. I, I honestly you not don't know the answer, them? but I, uh, one of my co-authors does. So I, I ask you to talk to Yvonne. He knows the answer. <laughs> Very briefly explain. So C is what you need to fly, like in, in a drone. B is what you need to go to space. A is the critical in space. These are publicly documented, by the way. Okay. You're not aiming for those? Yeah, but you need to get to class C first, ah, and then okay. you get to B, and then you get to A. We, we, are, we, we have a project where we'll need to use this for a class B as well. Lars Kutz, Kalina. Um, how do you ensure, or can you, can you assume that the control flow graphs match in the transition system that you get in what for? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I heard the word match and that was it. Yes, yeah, the, um, the um, control flow graphs, do they necessarily match in what for, or? Do you have to do some graph transformations? I'm not sure if LLVM has a stack or... Um, yeah, once you get to the level of what for, then they, they match up pretty naturally. The, the crucible will sort of um, turn your imperative program into a functional one. And, and at that point, it becomes much more easy to do program analysis on it. And crucible just does not just reverse compile your program then. So there's still some work left for the theory improver. Uh, it, it, it's an unfair question, yes, but I, so I wonder how much, you know, Crucible just knows about the semantics and just reverse compiles. Yes, <laughs> Crucible is definitely aware of the semantics of LLVM, if, if, if that is your question. And uh, we've, we've tested Crucible out on, on many LLVM-based projects and sort of we've, we've actually run this on an extensive suite of, of C test cases that were curated for verification purposes. So we're reasonably confident it can handle most of the things that you'd find in LLVM uh, that you'd see in these programs. Yeah, let's do a last question. Okay, John Hee Shalmage again. So um, in order to find a bug in the Copilot compiler, you still need a Copilot program that provokes that bug. So you told us that you found 10 such bugs. I, if it were me, I would now be writing a random generator for Copilot programs um, because it's, it's interesting to do random testing with your verifier as the test oracle, right? Have you considered that or maybe, maybe you already have a random generator for previous compiler testing of the Copilot compiler? Yes, I, I completely agree that, that it would be, be useful to have more um, property generated test for this. Uh, at the moment, the Copilot test suite consists of handwritten programs, but I, I think we should add more, precisely because this is, this is how you find bugs. We have a little time, there's a question from Tech, so let's go. Yeah, um, so in general, by simulation, I think is undecidable for Turing complete languages. Is there a way to get around it? Is Copilot like not fully Turing complete and you can do all the semantics there, or is it uh, or are there certain programs that you can't prove 
equivalent here because of that reason? Oh, th there are certainly programs that we cannot prove equivalent. Like, like we, we don't claim to skirt around undecidability. Like, like this is one example of something that you could improve. Um, maybe not quite for the reasons that you're thinking of. Um, and, and also keep in mind that we're, we're not sort of directly proving by simulation, where we're proving a separate thing which implies by simulation. So, so uh, the, the story is a little bit different there as far as the, the theoretical limits of what it can do. But, but yes, cer certainly there are limitations. All right, great, thank you. Well, thank you everybody. Let's thank the speaker again.